let's get started. I'm uh, Professor Andres Gossagamp. I'm coming live from Toronto, providing the transatlantic bridge for this transatlantic session, which is organized and hosted by the Johann Schütte Institute for Political Studies at the University of, of Tartu, uh, my former home. Uh, so I'm glad to be uh, with everyone in, in Tartu again. Uh, the purpose of our seminar is to provide the Northern European launch for um, a new volume, which has just been uh, published by Routledge, NATO and Transatlantic Relations in the 21st Century, Foreign and Security Policy Perspectives, uh, edited by Michaela Testone, who will be uh, our first speaker and who will present the chapters in the book. So I won't say very much about the book itself. I will stick to moderating uh, the event. I'll just say that today is focused only on the Northern European chapters of this book, which otherwise provides a comprehensive approach to uh, all of, of Europe. Um, so we have uh, four speakers who I will introduce as we get to them. Uh, they will have a maximum of 15 minutes each. They'll probably speak a little bit less. And then at the end, we'll have um, time for questions and comments. And any questions that you may have or comments, uh, please type them into the Q&A section at the bottom of the, at the, bottom of the screen. So um, without uh, any further ado, um, I will hand over to uh, Professor Testoni, who's from the EI University in Spain, and soon you will see his backdrop from uh, uh, Plas Mayora in, uh, in Madrid, so you'll know that he's really sitting there, um, maybe not having a cup of coffee, but uh, virtually at least, and in spirit. Um, he's the, the genius behind this, the mastermind behind this project who's brought it all together um, and managed to get it out in the midst of a, a pandemic and pull together a stellar cast of uh, contributors from all over Europe. And as I said, today we'll be uh, speaking with and listening to uh, the uh, authors of the Northern European chapters. Um, so with that, uh, I'll hand over to uh, Professor Testoni. Thank you, Andres, and thank you, thank all of you for being here. And in particular, thanks to the Johan Skitte Institute for having setting all this up. It's a great pleasure of being here, especially for a Friday afternoon, a pre a pre spring break Friday afternoon, which is in, you know we need to give uh, this uh, webinar and the whole of you who are here with us today uh, a much greater. Um, role and enthusiasm. So uh, again, this, uh, as, I've, as I've said, uh, we are here for to discuss NATO and in the in two, in two of the three uh, flanks in which uh, NATO operates. So the high north and the, the very higher part of the eastern flank. Uh, I'm talking to you from the southern flank. So we we'll try to physically uh, through Zoom to provide some sort of a coherence alliance. Uh, allow me my Warholian moment of self-promotion. This I know about Zoom, you don't see it. Book uh, is the book which I uh, as said I coordinated. I'm also one of the co-author about the uh, chapter of Spain. And uh, today with us we have Denmark, Norway and the Baltic States. So, uh, two disclaimers about uh, the, the, the general methodology, uh, objectives, and the meanings about, uh, about this publication, what it wanted to achieve, hopefully it hadn't, and what way. So the book was conceived uh, with one important disclaimer. Uh, it was conceived, written, and published during the Trump administration without knowing who would have been the 46th president of the United States, right? So before, before November the 4th, 2020. Uh, this is, I think, it's important to, to say, and you can, for all those of you who, who have read or already purchased or will purchase the book, 
uh, you will read through the folds of the publication, uh, all the authors and the, the introduction itself has remained uh, sufficiently aloof in this respect without giving any particular uh, forecast, forecasting in political science and, and even international relations and increasing, increasingly difficult by, by, on a day by day basis. So I think this has to be taken into consideration. Uh, the second uh, background, the second basic elements of the book is that it aims at uh, fulfilling one of the several, let's say, deficiencies or features better of the literature and international relations, and in particular of transatlantic uh, security uh, relations. It, it's a book that it's not about NATO, but talks about NATO. As you can see, it's a, it's, a, it's a book on a comparative foreign policy and security policy analysis. It comprises 11 chapters uh, regarding 11 member states, with only one exception, when need is the, the Baltic states, which is a three country uh, chapter, but we thought it could make sense to condense these countries in one. And these 11 countries are divided according to the three flanks. So we started with the United States, and which is inevitably chapter one. Then we, uh, we leave the floor for the, uh, the northern flank, high north. So we have uh, Canada, Britain, Norway, and Denmark. Then we pass to the eastern flank, Germany, Poland, the Baltic states. Last but not least, uh, the southern flank, Spain, Italy, and uh, Turkey. Uh, the book has, uh, as far as its academic uh, objectives is concerned, has three main priorities. One is to reinforce the thesis about the nature of international alliances, and in particular that the nature of the transatlantic bargain. Uh, we know that alliances are in the, the, the organizations, pacts, uh, related versus third parties, you know, members and third parties. But we think, uh, and we need to keep thinking about the importance of the relationships, you know, of inter-allied relationships, the way in which each partner should try to grab the maximum, you know, their junior or senior partners in order to advance their goals and what kind of uh, cooperative slash competitive uh, relationship uh, alliances create, especially a, a, a hold uh, and unique to very to many extent international alliances as NATO. The second goal is to, to shed some light over the cyclical uh, of the over the pendulum over transatlantic idiosyncrasies. And NATO's history is constellated by a, a sequence of highs and lows. Uh, the question, one of the questions we ask ourselves is what kind of uh, tensions, what kind of problems uh, is NATO to this level? Is business as usual or are some greater uh, issues at stake? Issues that come from you know, the rise of high polarity, the uh, inelastic uh, political and psychological perception that the Soviet Union is actually no more. Thirty years that you did the Soviet Union no more, but maybe a global NATO has found or need to find further enemy. Is Russia a old new enemy? What about China, etc. Uh, so the the second question is what the present is can be in what way the present can be characterized, in particular, if possible, what the future hold in store as far as uh, this pendulum between positive and negative, conflictual and cooperative relations uh, that characterize uh, NATO. Last but not least, as said, is to provide, uh, to contribute with our own humble uh, chapters uh, to make a further and different contribution to transatlantic relations, again, starting off from a, a traditional uh, inter-ala perspective allies are, what alliances, how they do perform, how NATO has evolved, but from a, let's say, second member perspective. So it's a comparison of the foreign and security and defense policy of its most important members. And 
uh, in this way, shed light on the continuities, on the differences, the similarities, uh, on the innovations uh, in terms of culture, domestic politics, uh, and what it's TBD. Could be the future of NATO, but not from a, could we say, a, a structural, so systemic NATO's life perspective, but uh, from members' perspective. It's uh, how each little piece of sand that the allies put on the inter ally beach, how can this, you know, could create, we could say, from a micro perspective, the macro approach. Uh, how we do this? Um, the idea was to, to use a three tire um, variable to describe and explain how the, the, those 11 member states that the book covers uh, have actually participated, are participating, and are likely to, uh, to keep participating in, in transatlantic relations. Like so each chapter, in a, I think, in a very good way, each on its own, of course, uh, look at, are divided in, in the, say, three general uh, parts. Uh, one is historical, so the evolution of those members on, into the alliance, so we need a sense of the, the, of the weight of history of any country's transatlantic policy. So, second is what is the actual contribution of our specific members, each chapter, chapter to the alliance life. And in this case, the second indicator is divided into two. One is the, uh, a broad analysis of the strategic vision uh, in terms of security and defense policy that that country has in relation to the, uh, the Atlantic relations, uh, in terms of you know, a broad uh, security and defense policy. Second is the very you know, concrete contribution, the output you know, that that member gives to the alliance in terms of defense spending. So we talk about uh, the, the Wales 2% uh, criterion, first, uh, troops deployment, uh, the sharing of assets, as well as any, kind, any other kind of activities or inputs that those specific members give in, the, the, in a fluctuating way, let's say, uh, with relation to the common goal, which is... Last but not least is the, uh, how that country now, not how NATO, from a, a Stoltenberg's perspective, so to speak, how NATO looks at itself, how the different pieces of NATO look at NATO in the future. So what is the, the role of European strategic autonomy, which I think is a very um, hot topic in today's Euro-Atlantic, Eurasian, let's say, relation. Uh, what is the role of Russia, how to deal with Russia, uh, to what extent NATO should look at the Indo-Pacific. Uh, last but not least, uh, this book was, um, was conceived, was written, was assembled in the aftermath of the December 2019 London Declaration in which a, an initial uh, China policy, so to speak, from the, by the Atlantic Alliance, it set into motion. Uh, I think I have how many? Two, two minutes, four, five minutes, uh, even less. One minute. Okay, one minute. The, 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 so the, the, I eventually respond to further questions in the, in the Q&A session. Allow me uh, just to, uh, to end my the, the brief introduction, which is hopefully aimed at uh, stimulating the whole of you to buy and read the book. Use it. Uh, a few weeks ago, we celebrated the, the 75th anniversary of Kennan's long telegram of the policy of contain. What does the future hold in store? Uh, I think that at least our intention, our aim was to, and I repeat it, to contribute with our great yet little piece of sand in this debate, because uh, the future, the foreseeable future, uh, need to include that. I think it looks very interesting. Thank you and see you in the Q&A. Thank you, Michaela. Okay, now we've gotten an, an overview of the, of the themes and the logic and the structure 
of of the book from the from the editor and now we will turn to the authors of the individual chapters and we'll start logically from the furthest north uh from from norway and that will be dr karsten fries who's uh, a senior researcher at nupi which is the norwegian institute of international affairs uh in oslo uh let me just mention that uh, dr fries uh as a PhD from, from Groningen, and he has a lot of practical experience on the ground in the Western Balkans with the OSCE, with NATO, and the EU. So the full, the full uh, range of uh, international organizations working there in many different capacities. Uh, so the floor is yours, Karsten. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you so much for, for inviting me to the University of, of Tartu and, of course, to, to Michele for, for putting together this, this excellent book. Now, of course, in my few minutes, I kind of go through all the aspects of the chapter that, that he talked about. So I encourage viewers to, 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 of course, buy the book and read in more detail. Since it's Friday afternoon, I plan to give you some slides, but the only picture is no text. So you should be able to, to en enjoy it. So, so let me just crack on, shall we? So next slide, please. You see here a picture of the of the head of the of the, the chief of the of the Russian Northern Fleet, uh, Alexander Moiseev, and a Norwegian uh, head of the operation headquarters from last year or two years ago now, the 75 years uh, anniversary of the liberation of Eastern Finnmark, the northernmost county of Norway. I'm putting this picture because when it comes Because Norway has, in contrast to Poland and many other, many other countries, never experienced war with Russia. And as I already said, in 1944, actually, this northern part of Norway was liberated by the Red Army. They stayed for about a year and then withdrew. And that withdrawing uh, is it's in itself uh, rather unique after the Second World War, as you all know. Um, but this liberation is a living memory in, in Norway, and particularly in the northern Norway. Uh, with a view of Russia as, as uh, more positive than many other places uh, in Europe and also between North and South of Norway. Now, um, maybe because of this, uh, when Norway joined NATO in 1949, we decided to, to have a careful approach. We introduced something called a basing policy. In other words, we shouldn't have any allied bases, permanent bases in Norway on, in peacetime. And there were several other al others also um, self self-imposed uh, limitations. So this was a kind of a giving an understanding of the Soviet concern about uh, Norway potentially becoming a kind of a staging ground for a potential attack against the Soviet Union. Uh, so that was the situation for, for a long time. Um, but after the, and after the Cold War, um, the, the neighbor relations with Russia really flourished and it was a people-to-people -people communication, there was trade, environmental cleanup, etc etc it was a very positive period uh, and it was kind of the, the peak of it all was in the breakthrough in 2010 with a diplomatic settlement of a 40 year old border dispute out in the Barents Sea uh, which was settled then uh, with success so we don't have any you know disagreements with Russia on, on anything then of course 2014 comes and everything changes the Norwegian defense minister at the time she's now a foreign minister said then that that the situation has changed profoundly, she said, with there's no, uh, no going back to some sort of normality, she said. That was strong words, uh, and since then that's been kind of the mantra. So what is the situation? Why, why are we concerned about Russia? Next slide, please. Well, the main reason are these guys, uh, these are the strategic submarines uh, with, with, uh, with uh, ballistic missiles that can reach the United States. This is the second strike capability of, of, of Russia, the cornerstone of the security. Pre protecting these, uh, which are based up north, is, is the most important role of the Russian Navy and armed forces up there. Uh, so the military, there's a huge military apparatus in, 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 on the Kola Peninsula, not targeted against Norway, but just happened to be our next door neighbor. Uh, and that, of course, it's, uh, it can be a challenge, and, and most analysts um, expect that in case of, of a conflict, uh, Russia will push out the defense lines far into the sea towards Iceland, uh, and thereby denying NATO assets to, to sail or fly in this area, or try to deny it. 
of course, being in Norway, then somewhat kind of behind enemy lines, as it were, uh, it's, it's not a very comfortable place to be in. So that is, that is, you know, that's been since the Cold War being the main challenge for Norway that we are so close to these, these, uh, these weapons and therefore will be part of a theater uh, of, a, of a war where, which doesn't really, it's not necessarily about us as such. But we can become part of it both on sea and land. Um, next slide, please. This is another reason why we're concerned. And this is the latest class of, of Russian submarines, Severodvinsk. Um, these, these, can, these are multitask submarines, can reach all the way to the United States uh, and, and the sea lines of communication across the Atlantic. So they also have missiles that can reach capitals of most of Europe from, from, the, from the Norwegian Sea. Uh, so they represent a threat to the whole Europe. So they also, in addition to the strategic submarines, these guys are also you know, a European concern. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, all the, all the precision guided missiles. These are the these are the caliber missiles that can be put on any ship they have. They also have similar systems on board all the submarines and, and the vessels they have, which again uh, you know makes makes warning time and distance matter less than it did some years ago. These are close to the Norwegian border and as you also have in, in Kaliningrad and other places. And then there's of course also lots of other missiles, hypersonics and stuff being developed. A lot got into that here. Um, Slide six. Uh, yes, please. Um, we also have experience, though, uh, let's say not friendly behavior. This is simulated attacks on Norwegian territory on the radar station there. This is one out of several, several examples some years ago. Uh, when we have exercises, they, they signal very clearly. Uh, we, we don't do simulate, simulated attacks against their territory, to put it that way. Um, and the next slide, please. We also have several uh, instances of GPS jamming uh, from the Russian side that impacts Norwegian civilian aircraft, but also all other as uh, you know users of GPS, including our own cars and, <laughs> and Google Maps and others, but more seriously with flying uh, um, commercial aviation. So you know this is a challenge you know we are facing during during the during the exercises. Uh, we are we are close to a, to a more and more um, potent neighbor. So what shall we do then? Um, from a Norwegian point of view, I mean, how much deterrence should we have? How much reassurance should we have? Referring to what I said earlier about, uh, you know, not, not giving them unnecessary um, concern. If you see the red line here, all the way to the left, this is more or less covering the northernmost county of Norway called Finnmark. It's bigger than Denmark. And we have decided to have very limited military activity there. So most of our military activity is east of, or to the left of, of, the, of the red line there we see. So, so that is that is one of the you know measures we take to 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 ease tensions as well. But uh, but uh, at the same time, we have also need to have a strong defense to protect our territory. And the defense budget has increased a lot over the last few years. It's now about six point five billion euros a year, which has uh, which has in an increased quite 30 40 percent over the last years. And now we well because of COVID we reached the two percent of the of the of the GDP, but before COVID it was about one point eight. Um, so that has to do not with the increased budget, but the decrease uh, of the national GDP production. Um, so next slide, please. What are we doing? Well, Norway has has ordered uh, fifty two of these guys. They are B the 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 F thirty fives. So that's quite a fleet. I mean, the latest number from UK is. Almost, you know, they have re about to reduce it, so it's almost the same. Uh, so that's that's the most potent power we have and we are getting now. We used to have F-16s, so and now we're replacing them. Um, and then next place um, on the army side, it's more limited. We have one brigade, which is uh, limited. It has three maneuver battalions, but it's not really meeting NATO standards, and uh, the tanks in particular are aging. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we have we have uh, we have uh, army army presence up north, primarily up north. And then next slide, please. Uh, we have four frigates. We have some smaller vessels you see there, the fast ones. But again, in the numbers, are not many. And uh, we just buy about to buy four new submarines in cooperation with Germany. Uh, next, please. Yeah, we used to have five frigates. 
So that's what happens. Uh, but on the whole, and besides this picture is not very telling, but but I mean, Norway, Norwegian armed forces in European context, it's small, but quite potent. Uh, quite a lot of investments being made in the last few years. Nonetheless, in comparison to, to, to Russia, we will always be small. So uh, next, please. Um, for us, of course, NATO alliance, uh, this has extended to deterrence uh, that we are dependent on. We will, no matter how much we, we, we strengthen our, our, our military, we will not be able to deter Russia in it ourselves. And, and Norway has always been a reluctant participate, and then in contrast to Denmark, I would say, a, a reluctant participate in the, in the in the international operations during the, let's say, the int ops years of NATO. So, so when NATO kind of returned home after 2014, uh, returned home to collective defense, that was strongly supported and welcomed by Norway. And all these new initiatives that came, uh, the readiness action plan, the graduate response plans, the, the enhanced forward presence in the Baltic and the Poland, I, I mean, all these things were strongly supported by Norway. And, and Norway also championed very much the, the reform of the command structure of NATO. And this picture here is from the opening of the NATO, NATO uh, Guards Forces Command Norfolk in, in, in Virginia, US, which was celebrated when that was decided, was celebrated as a victory in Norway because we've been lobbying for that. Uh, as you know, U.S. also uh, re-established its second fleet, uh, and it's a bit unclear now if it's the sixth fleet or second fleet that covers the northern territories, but, but nonetheless, U.S. is back, NATO is back, and, and we have a command that had a particular you know, focus on the northern part of, of, of Europe. Uh, so that is all good news from a Norwegian, a Norwegian point of view. And of course, you also have strong bilateral relations with, with the U.S. in addition to the what would happen through NATO. And then my last slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. The, the point is that, oops, one too many. <laughs> there you go. Um, the point is that we, we, um, we have urged uh, allies to focus on the North for many years, uh, especially during the, the, the difficult, so to speak, 90s and, and 2000s. Now that has that pendulum has swung, re, swung really strongly back. There's almost too much allied or blue activity now. There's more, it's more Russian activity than before, more exercises, but it's also more allied exercises. To the left, you see a British American patrol free navigation operation last year, which flew, which, which, which sailed uh, you know, very close to Russian waters. Uh, we had lots of strategic flights from the US. Um, you know, so, so the activity from both sides in the north is now so strong that there's a debate in Norway if it's too much, if it's actually you know, increasing tensions instead of signaling, uh, signaling deterrence. Now, of course, that's, uh, that's an argument, that's a debate to be continued, but uh, that is, uh, if you want to have the, you know, the flavor of the, of the debate in Norway right now, is this, that we are suddenly in the middle of these big power, power games, uh, uh, which we may be not be able to influence as much as we would like. I will stop there and I'm happy to take questions and comments later on. Thank you. Andres, you are muted. Oops. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Fries, for that. And let us now turn to uh, uh, the southern portion of, of Northern Europe, which is Denmark. Um, and uh, Peter uh, Viggo Jakobsen, who is Associate Professor at the Department of Strategy at the Royal Danish Defense College, and also Professor at the Center of War Studies at the University of Southern Denmark. And Petra's chapter, of course, focuses on, on Denmark. Denmark, of course, uh, was one of the key contributors to uh, the Baltic states' um, success in uh, acceding to NATO um, 20 years ago. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. I'll just see if I can figure out how to share my screen.
fluted lid. It's on there. Here you go. So now you should be able to see my, my slides. Uh, what I did in, in my chapter was that I took a look at the evolution of uh, Denmark's NATO policy since uh, NATO, Denmark joined the alliance back in 49. And then I looked at the evolution of that policy all the way uh, until 2019. See if I can figure out how to change this. Yep, here we go. Uh, and I intend to basically structure my remarks uh, in the following way. First, I'll touch upon the drivers of the Danish NATO strategy that I, def I identify in my article. Then I'll say something about the, the so, sorry, I'll just move on quickly. Uh, uh, the question I uh, the, the question I ask in my is my in my in my uh, article is uh, what has driven the, the Danish alliance policy in in this period, and to give you quickly the answer, what I basically argue is that the Danish uh, alliance policy, uh, not uh, unlike the Norwegian one, has been driven by three factors. The first was the need to maintain the American security guarantee but without uh, becoming entrapped in a, a, a potential a great power war between the Soviet Union uh, and the United States. The second driver of the Danish uh, alliance policy was the attempt to try and achieve the US security guarantee on the cheap. Denmark has never ever spent the amount of money on defense that the Alliance and the Americans have demanded. That was true in 49, and that remains uh, true today in, in 2021. And the third driver of the Danish NATO policy is a driver that uh, is created after the end of the Cold War. And that is a desire to establish and maintain uh, a high standing, a high status uh, in the eyes of the other uh, alliance members, and especially in the eyes of the United States. When I, when I uh, look at the way these three drivers has interacted uh, and, and shaped a NATO, uh, Na Danish NATO policy, you can see that Danish uh, membership policy evolves through, th through three distinct phases. The first one covers uh, the Cold War. The second phase covers uh, the post-Cold War era from the collapse of the Soviet Union in in 1889-90 until uh, the re-emergence of the Russian threat in 2014. And then the, the third period is the con contemporary one starting in uh, 2014 with the Russian decision to use force uh, in the Ukraine. And if we look at uh, the Danish uh, policy and position in NATO during the, the Cold War, I, I, I called uh, Denmark a NATO laggard in this uh, period of time. And I do this because that is basically how NATO was uh, perceived by the other uh, NATO members. Norway was quite concerned about uh, the limited willingness of Denmark to spend on defen defense in the early 50s. And as we get up to the, uh, to the 80s, Denmark even, uh, there was even a new uh, uh, term coined uh, after Denmark that was called Denmarkization. And Denmarkization referred to a NATO member that was quite happy to be defended uh, by the other members but was unwilling to bear its fair share of the burden. And the reason for that was that Denmark uh, imposed a lot of national caveats uh, on its, its membership. Now, it wasn't called national caveats at the time. That was a term that became fashionable to describe uh, the restrictions that NATO members imposed on their uh, nat national contributions to the uh, NATO operation in Afghanistan. But it also covers the restrictions on Na NATO membership that Denmark imposed uh, during the Cold War. Uh, they, in many respects, are similar to the ones that were also imposed by Norway. 
both Denmark and Norway said no to accept the uh, deployment of foreign troops uh, on, 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 on national soil in peacetime. Uh, like uh, Norway, Denmark did not want nuclear weapons on Danish soil in peacetime. They said no to pre-position uh, American equipment on Danish soil. And they also uh, restricted uh, NATO presence on the island of Bornholm in uh, the Baltic Sea. And Denmark also refrained from letting its uh, ships and and uh, planes participate in uh, NATO maneuvers east of the uh, island of Bornholm in the Baltic Sea in order not to provoke the Soviet Union. We also saw Denmark being very unwilling to participate in operations outside of Europe. When the Americans asked uh, Denmark for a combat, combat contribution to the Korean War in 1950, Denmark refused and they kept stalling the Americans. And in the end, Denmark uh, contributed with a medical ship or a hospital ship that was staffed by Red Cross personnel in order to signal that Denmark did not want to make a military contribution to the Korean War. Uh, so in that sense, Denmark was together with Italy, uh, the only two members who did not of NATO who did not make any military contribution to uh, the Korean War. And that sort of signals the way Denmark tried to keep its head down and avoid getting caught in uh, controversies between the United States and the Soviet Union. And throughout the period, Denmark spent as little as on defense and it, as it could possibly get away with. It was always a great haggling match between NATO and Denmark whenever uh, spending targets were discussed in, 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 in Brussels. Uh, and uh, the United States, when we came up, up until uh, the, light eight, uh, the, the late eighties, even threatened to withhold its uh, military support for Denmark in the event of a war, if Denmark did not increase its spending. So, President Trump was actually not the first uh, U.S. president or uh, representative of the United States to make uh, its support for Article 5 conditional uh, upon increased uh, defense spending because uh, U.S. representatives actually uttered that threat uh, to Denmark on a number of occasions during the 80s. Then we have uh, the end of the Cold War. And with that, of course, we have a complete transformation of the strategic environment. All of a sudden, there's no longer any, any uh, reason to be afraid of the Soviet Union. And as was just uh, mentioned, Denmark played a leading role in trying to get the Baltics uh, invited into uh, NATO and the EU. And Denmark actually pursued quite an aggressive uh, policy in the Baltics, trying to uh, get the Baltic countries admitted into the EU and NATO as quickly as possible. And initially, uh, both Germany and the US was actually somewhat concerned that Denmark was being just a little bit too aggressive in in its support for the Baltic uh, countries. Uh, Denmark also lifted all its national constrictions on operations in the, in, in, in the, in the Baltic and uh, in other ways. And Denmark also engaged in a complete transformation of its armed forces. It, it scrapped its national uh, defense structures completely and transformed their forces into expeditionary ones that could plug and play, plug and play with uh, UK and US forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, so in this way, Denmark uh, began to be perceived uh, among the other members of the alliance, and not least as in the United States, as a NATO leader that, that showed how other countries could uh, reform their armed forces and how they could make uh, contrib uh, contributions to international operations. And Denmark suffered the highest number of uh, fatalities uh, in Afga Afghanistan if you measure uh, the Danish losses in proportion in proportion to its uh, population. And, and all these uh, contributions enabled Denmark to increase a very, uh, to, a, uh, to, to establish a very close relationship with the United States and Danish prime ministers after uh, 
1997 became regular visitors to the to the White House. So in that sense, Denmark was treated almost as if uh, almost on a par with uh, the United Kingdom. And and you and and the and and the U.S. Uh, representatives even at one stage told the, the U.K. to be more like Denmark because Denmark was just a great ally. And uh, of course, they they took offense to that in 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 London because the U.K. contributed a lot more to both Iraq and Afghanistan than Denmark did. But Denmark was in many ways during this period of time seen as a model ally. And this was despite of the uh, of the fact that Denmark, uh, like most other alliance members, cut their, their cut their defense sp spending like uh, crazy in this period. Uh, Denmark uh, cut its defense spending nonstop from uh, ninety two uh, through uh, two thousand and uh, and seventeen, and uh, by uh, two thousand and fourteen, Denmark spent just above one percent of GDP on defense. But the, but the U.S. did not really care about uh, the drop in U, uh, Danish defense spending during this period of time because Denmark uh, scored high on all the other things that the U.S. valued. Now, this all came to uh, a crushing end in 2014 when Russia began to use force uh, in, in, in the Ukraine. All of a sudden, the, the burden sharing game shifted in NATO and NATO made the uh, Wales uh, commitment to start spending, uh, increasing to, to increase uh, defense spending and to achieve at spending 2% two, uh, 2 of GDP on defense by 2024. Now, Denmark did not want to do that. Uh, and uh, Denmark initially passed a defense agreement in 2018 uh, that only uh, increased Den Danish spending to 1.3% of GDP by uh, 2024. Because of that, uh, Denmark was subjected to a barrage of criticism from the United States. And because of this uh, criticism that really took Danish decision makers by, the, uh, by surprise, they decided uh, one year into this uh, new defense agreement that was passed in 2018 to increase uh, the spending level to 1.5% of GDP by 2024. Uh, but there was still a strong resistance to the idea that Denmark should spend 2% of GDP. And this unwillingness, plus the fact that Denmark was having a lot of capabilities problems because they have. Uh, reduce the size of their armed forces so heavily, that meant that they had problems meeting uh, NATO's uh, capability uh, objectives, and it was also increasingly difficult for Denmark to meet uh, U.S. expectations in terms of troop commitments. And for that, and for that, for this reason, Denmark has lost its uh, status as a as a leader in NATO. And I would even argue that, that you could also question whether other members these days see Denmark as a loyal member of the alliance. Uh, and this loss of status and the fact that you, uh, the U.S. no longer invites uh, Danish uh, prime ministers to the White House and the new uh, U.S. president, uh, Joe Biden, has not even called the Danish prime minister. And this is something of a different to what Denmark has been used to before. This has uh, kick-started a, a major debate in Denmark about whether uh, how much we should spend on defense uh, in, in Denmark, whether we should go to 2% and so on and so forth. And there's also been a lot of hand-wringing among Danish uh, politicians about the fact that perhaps we are no longer seen as, as, the, as the perfect NATO ally and so on and so forth. Uh, this debate, uh, I think, uh, is going to mean that, that Denmark will actually increase defense spending in its next defense uh, agreement that will take, uh, that, that, will, that, will, uh, that will begin in 2025. And the reason I think that is not just because Danish politicians are currently saying that they will actually increase uh, their defense spending in by 2025 and they will aim for actually reaching 2%. Now, talk is cheap, of course, and there's a long time between now and 2025. And once the, uh, the, the, the bill for the corona aid packages start to kick in, then I can easily imagine politicians having second thoughts about spending 2% of GDP on defense. 
But there are another of other, two other factors that actually may, or, or three factors that may actually encourage Danish politicians to increase their defense spending uh, to, to 2%. The first is the fact that there's a very big uh, ends and means disconnect uh, within the Danish armed forces these days. Uh, Danish politicians continue to have high, high ends and expectations about what the armed forces are uh, supposed to do in terms of international missions. But at the same time, the, the, the armed forces no longer have the capabilities to conduct these missions uh, and meet these ex political expectations. The second is the fact that Danish politicians really uh, grow, grow fond of their leader status in NATO, and they, 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 they always refer to Denmark as a core member of the alliance and one of the best friends that the United States has ever had. And, and they really would like to regain that status. So that would also put pressure on them to increase uh, spending. And then the third factor that may also push Denmark is in, in this direction is the fact that Denmark has benchmarks its spending to that of Norway, the Netherlands and Germany. And, and it, it looks as though normally Norway is going to, to reach uh, 2% in the not too distant future. And if the Netherlands and, and Germany also move in this direction, then I think that Denmark will feel the need to, to follow suit. And, and the implication of all this is, of course, that with, if, if most European NATO members continue to increase their defense spending, then we're going to have a more balanced NATO where it's going to be easier for uh, the US president to convince its voters that the EU, the Europe is actually, you know, uh, uh, bearing a fair uh, part of the burden. And, and that will then make it easier for uh, the United States to continue to justify its, its, its membership of NATO and its military presence in Europe. And with that, I look forward to your questions. All right, thank you very much, Peter. But before we get to the questions, and I'll remind everyone that you can write your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, uh, we'll get to our final presentation, which is on the three Baltic states. Um, even though it, it covers Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, then uh, it's two doctoral students at the University of Tartu in Estonia who are covering uh, all three. Um, and it's going to be a combined presentation with uh, first the veteran PhD student Owen McNamara, who's perhaps the, the best known Irish specialist on NATO, but been living in Estonia for decades, um, who, will, who will start. And then uh, uh, Marie-Lise uh, Marie Sulk, who's also a doctoral student at the Schutt Institute in, in Tartu, will give a sort of a, a view of the, the future prospects under the Biden presidency. Uh, so, uh, Mr. McNamara, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I have seven and a half minutes. Uh, I suppose the best way to explain how we're going to organize our presentation here between Marielise and, and, and myself is that I'm the past and Marielise is the present, the Biden perspective and the future, uh, which I think suits, suits quite well. Um, so our chapter, the Baltic States and NATO, we, we aim to give a, uh, a fairly comprehensive overview of, of the journey uh, the Baltic States have been on. Uh, since they joined uh, NATO in 2000 and 2004. And um, this journey, of course, uh, I'm, I'm from Ireland. I'm the only non-NATO person in, involved technically in, 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 this, uh, in, in this discussion, but, but I, I do a lot of work on, on NATO in the Baltic States. As, as Andres said, it really was a, a rocky road, maybe, maybe not to Dublin, but a rocky road to Tallinn or to Riga or, or, or to Vilnius. Uh, that that really rode the crest of, of, of a wave in the sense of, of NATO being a, a multi-purpose uh, alliance. Some say that the Baltic states have, have fantasies that they wanted to join the, the, the NATO of 1949, the NATO that would, would show resolute territorial defense uh, to the threat from the east, Russia, uh, in 1949's case, uh, the Soviet Union. But this was not the NATO... Uh, that the Baltic states joined. They, they entered NATO and the call was, what are you going to do in Afghanistan? And of course, 
the Baltic states had, had newly refashioned their military organizations. They had undergone a lot of uh, defense reform, a lot of reform in civil military relations. Uh, they were very inexperienced, uh, but they thought big. Uh, they thought big and, and they delivered uh, in, in many ways. We saw this uh, with Estonia in, in Helmand province going in there, very similar to, to Denmark that, that Peter just spoke of, going in there without caveats, getting a lot of praise, uh, being referred to as the model ally, fighting in that elite group uh, in, in Helmand province, Denmark, the United Kingdom and the United States, um, suffering some casualties and all around being involved at, at the sharp end of, of ISAF. Uh, Latvia was involved with security sector reform, mentorship and training, and Latvia also was a key, key piece in the puzzle for the Northern Distribution Network. Uh, Lithuania took on a highly ambitious task of, of leading the provincial reconstruction team in Gore in 2000, uh, after 2004, after they, after they joined. And, and had many struggles leading that, but saw it through to the end, uh, despite the pain and, and despite the struggle. So the Baltic states came out of Afghanistan uh, with their reputation, with their status in the alliance, uh, very much uh, not just intact, but enhanced. And there's a great op-ed written by Joe Biden, a, a hidden document uh, written in 2013, where he actually praises the Baltic states for this. And, and they... Uh, they certainly uh, paid their dues there. Some people like to criticize the Baltic states as net cons security uh, consumers. That might be the case now in, in some ways with the enhanced forward presence, even though they keep trying their best to bridge that gap. Um, but uh, certainly they were security uh, producers in a niche sense when we talk about ISAF uh, in Afghanistan. They punched well above their weight. Uh, so, um, 2014 was also the it was it was the year that that ISAF uh, in Afghanistan ended to be replaced by Operation Resolute Support, but uh, but uh, it was the year of of Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea, and the Baltic states have displayed steady diplomacy and steady military development as as in in their role as host nations as coordinators for NATO's enhanced forward presence oftening partnering with other Nordic states, Denmark, Norway, uh, Poland uh, to the south to, to lobby and to push within the alliance for gradual improvement of, of NATO's enhanced forward presence and, and build up this tripwire deterrence. At the NATO Wales summit, we got these units rotating in and out about 150 US troops. At NATO's Warsaw summit, it was formalized that we would get uh, battalion-sized battle groups that would be multinational. Britain leads in the Baltic states, uh, Canada in Latvia, uh, Germany in Lithuania, and the United States leads uh, a bigger than battalion size, a brigade or approaching brigade size uh, battle, battle group in, in Poland. Uh, and all looked to be going well. Barack Obama visited Estonia in, in 2014, and he made that famous phrase, that famous statement that the defense of Tallinn, Riga and Vilnius, uh, they are uh, the same high value as Berlin, London and, and Paris. And despite uh, the, the jitters that had been caused in the region by, by Russia's revanchism, uh, we, uh, things seem to be going well on, on, the side, uh, on the side of deterrence. And then, of course, uh, enter Mr. Trump. Um, in unexpectedly uh, won the uh, US presidential election uh, in 2016, took up office in 2017. On his way to office, he said a few things about the Baltic states, you know, have they paid their bills? If they've paid their bills, we might extend Article 5 or we will. If they haven't, mm, we might see. He gave that signal. And of course, Estonia, spending its 2%, took this uh, with, with some dismay. Um, Latvia and Lithuania took it with dismay, uh, some might say with positive dismay, because they have increased uh, their defense uh, spending um, since it's given them a pleasant shock, uh, some might say. Um, Trump, um, Trump has, uh, what, is, what else has Trump done? Um, despite some of this rhetoric, 
uh, for many years, particularly the early years of the Trump administration under Jim Mattis as Secretary of Defense and H.R. McMaster as Trump's National Security Advisor, um, Trump kept the enhanced forward presence going, uh, kept it ticking over operationally, was, was augmenting things incrementally, was, was still playing that operational coordinating role, despite some loose statements uh, from the president. Towards the end, uh, we got, uh, of the Trump administration, we got the betrayal of, of the Kurds uh, in the Syrian dem Democratic Forces, and we got Trump's announcement that he planned a, U a further U.S. military withdrawal drawdown uh, from Germany, 9,500 troops. And both of these were looked at as, as small states, often very dependent on the United States for their security. Both of these um, sat very uncomfortably in the Baltic states. But it's not just populism from Washington. Uh, there was also populism uh, in, in the Baltic states themselves, mostly one party, the uh, Conservative People's Party of Estonia, ECRE, uh, who are very pro and independent defense posture uh, for Estonia and have a tendency to link things like linking defense provided uh, to Estonia with uh, the immigration crisis. They're quite anti-immigration. And we've had their chairman, um, Mart Helma, come out and say that um, that if 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 we had a better independent defense capacity, we wouldn't need to to take orders from uh, NATO's uh, European members and we could deny uh, immigration quotas and things like that. Uh, which kind of fly in the face of Estonia's long held never again without allies. Um, uh, defense policy, which has set the tone uh, in a dominant way since the Baltic states uh, gained their independence in 1991. The reaction from Vilnius and from Riga was, we wish Mr. Helmer would stop with this fly in the ointment, would, would stop spitting in the soup and would simply be quiet. Um, and we've had a few of these moments. We had also um, a, a big opponent domestically to, to, to Ekra and to Helmer. Estonian President uh, Kirsty Kaljulaid, her visit to Moscow in, in 2019, uh, where it looked like there was a more pragmatic turn in, in, in Estonian uh, foreign policy, looking maybe to, to, to balance things a little bit. Uh, this left the two other Baltic states uncomfortable. We talk about this more in the chapter. We had the outspoken Lithuanian Foreign Minister, Linas Linkashevis, saying that we should, Estonia shouldn't go it alone. Going it alone gives Russia a chance to play divide and conquer. All these things should be coordinated between the three Baltic states. Nevertheless, despite this um, meeting, nothing much has happened since. And uh, we have got uh, Joe Biden, who, who is very pro-Baltic security and very much the traditional Atlanticist that, is, uh, that, that the Baltic states uh, relish in, in their security policy. And, and I'll hand over to Mary Lise and she can talk about this. Thank you very much. Yes, good evening from Tallinn. I do not have any slides, but it is a great pleasure to share this Friday evening with all of you. And as it was already mentioned, we made a friendly decision to share our 15 minutes so that I would share some thoughts on the current state of play. And I will also share some future looking visions on NATO and transatlanticism from the Baltic perspective. So first of all, some words about the then and now perspective. As you already learned from Owen's presentation, then our chapter on Baltic states touched upon the transatlantic bargain from the time of post-NATO accession to the election of Trump. And it was written at the time when the re-election of Trump seemed as a possibility. Therefore, it could be stated that between the time of writing and today, a whole new chapter has been opened in transatlantic history. Vice President Biden promised to be back in 2016, and indeed it is very encouraging for the Baltic states to have an advocate for multilateralism in the White House, who sees the cooperation between Europe and the US as a solution, not as Europe taking advantage of the US. Um, the Biden presidency definitely is speaking the language the Baltic states have been longing to hear, and instead of traditional reset attempts from the incoming administrations, the tone to talk with Russia has been much more assertive compared to the previous era of 
unpredictability under President Trump. Um, in addition to reassuring the importance of multilateralism and being assertive on Russia, the Biden administration has also made efforts to deliver separate reassuring messages to the Baltic states. And, uh, and the last one was given by Secretary Blinken to the Baltic foreign ministers in Prussia just a few days ago. Nevertheless, as Trump's presidency was not an eternal one, so will not be Biden's, and uh, even if he really should decide to go for the second term. And perhaps what Trump's presidency has taught us is the careful reading of the proportion between the actions and words of the US administration. And uh, therefore, the Biden's administration does not mean a political holiday for the Baltic states and our perspective continues not to take our security for granted and the constant transatlantic bargain continues to be our daily reality. And there continue to be plenty of reasons for that cautious perspective. And um, if during the Trump's presidency the concerned Baltic look was rather directed towards the other side of the Atlantic Ocean then the current focus of the Baltic states is pretty much tied within the eastern neighborhood of Europe, but also with the European allies of NATO. First of all, I would mention here Germany and the recent re reasoning for the Nord Stream 2 as an inevitable cooperation to offer a political compensation to Russia for its losses during the Second World War. And that really does not accord with the former official line that has advocated for keeping the politics apart from economy. Further, I would mention France, while pursuing the idea of strategic autonomy of Europe that could have been actually put aside together with the end of Trump's presidency, the idea keeps floating in political discussions. And without having a very concrete vision on what does it really mean, then anything that could be seen as a possible alternative to NATO, it is hard to be found from the Baltic vocabulary. Um, also, the French idea of the new security architecture of Europe that should slash could include Russia is not the way the Baltic states are willing to contribute into, the, into countering the rise of China. Instead, we prefer to see through the joint transatlantic lens. Also, the increasingly liberal Turkey and its growingly transactional politics inside NATO remains in the list of problems from the Baltic perspective when looking into the future of NATO. And that slowly brings me to the final point of my remarks. And here I would like to say some words about the ongoing strategic discussion on NATO 2030 and the question of this debate on the future of NATO asks, how to make NATO an even stronger alliance? Exactly one year ago, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg uh, appointed a group of experts to support him in his NATO 2030 initiative. Unfortunately, no representatives from the Baltic states who currently host the enhanced foreign presence troops on their ground were not invited to that group. Nevertheless, at the time of uncertainties, it is in the highest interest of the Baltic states not to be a flyover zone only, but to have a say in strategic discussions on how to deal with uncertainties and to have a joint solidarity based view on how to strengthen NATO. As we also mentioned in our chapter, the Baltic states have been criticized as one theme countries not fitting well with NATO as a multi-purpose institution. And while looking into the future, here our challenge again stands, how to keep the current focus on deterrence so that it would not fall back to reassurance. Having said that, I mean that we, the Baltic states, have been in the focus now, but how to keep the attention on us when China is rising and the other non-conventional threats, such as climate change and pandemics, are entering into NATO's agenda remains a great challenge for us. How do you adapt with, a, how do you adapt with not multipolar, but I would say with a multiplex world, so that the new threats would not be tackled on the expense of the previous ones? Therefore, I would conclude with a question that probably haunts many Baltic minds. How to tackle with the view that says Russia is threat only for you, but China poses threat on all of us? Thank you. Thank you, marie -Lise. That's a very good note to, to finish on. I just thank all of the uh, speakers for very rich presentations. And now we have about 15 minutes for uh, discussion. Uh, we have one question from uh, Jaak Laia, which I'll read out. And uh, 
it's a question to 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 Peter um, regarding Denmark's political consensus on the importance of the uh, membership in NATO. Uh, and the question is, if you could just delve more into how this consensus has formed and how is this consensus achieved and kept despite what should be, at least in principle, different differing ideological views on military bloc membership versus neutrality or the necessity of military uh, spending. So the first question is to you, Peter. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, how, how is the, it, it is actually true that the Danish uh, foreign and security is by and large uh, decided by consensus. There was a disagreement about the Danish uh, decision to participate in the U.S. attack on uh, on Iraq back in 2003, but that's sort of the outlier. Uh, most of uh, all other all other decisions related to defense uh, since the end of the Cold War has been basically decided by a broad agreement in in Parliament, and the re and and there's no one that's actually entering the discussion as to whether Denmark should go back to neutrality or should be uh, within the US alliance. That that debate uh, died died uh, died in the 60s basically and there's no one of any influence in Denmark that questions the Danish uh, membership of the alliance. So we don't have this debate at all. The debate is is essentially on how can we get the, the security guarantee uh, without paying uh, more than we absolutely have to? Uh, and that, that, that really is the discussion. Uh, and and, for, and, 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 and uh, the reason it, the, the way this consensus is, is shaped and maintained is essentially uh, by this system we have with five-year uh, defense agreements. That means that you only have to de de debate defense and de defense spend spending every five years. And there's also an official norm uh, within Danish politics that if you want to be a governing party, if you want to be a member of a, a governing uh, coalition, then you have to be part of the uh, defense agreement. And if you can't, if you if you're not that, then you're not uh, suitable for governing Denmark. So that also keeps pressure on the more leftist parties who uh, would normally be opposed to spending too much on defense and also be opposed to the U.S. or even NATO membership. Whenever they have uh, come into a position where they might actually be able to join uh, the government, then they have rescinded their opposition to NATO membership uh, and, and 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 even supported the war in Afghanistan. So. So this has sort of a very strong uh, magnetic pull that, that if you are a responsible politician in Denmark, you support uh, NATO de defense spending and everybody can agree that we need to be uh, inside the alliance. We also need to have a reasonably good relationship to the United States and therefore we need to spend the mi minimum required for that uh, uh, to happen. And that minimum required has then been determined by external factors. What other uh, membership, other NATO members have decided to to spend on defense, and here we benchmark ourselves towards Norway, the Netherlands, and Germany, and also our perception perception of the threat environment. So it's a combination of these internal uh, domestic factors and the external threat environment that keeps the consensus together and and shapes it. Okay, thank you, Peter. We have a question from Alex Hardy. Um, specifically regarding the Baltic states and primarily the future of EFP. Uh, we have seen in the last week or so that the UK, the UK announcing they will downsize their conventional forces, instead preferring to focus on their nuclear deterrent. Of course, the UK is a contributor to the EFP in Estonia. Just how necessary is the EFP, given most anal analysts consider it would be largely ineffective in the event of a kinetic conflict anyway? Do you see any potential change to this in the short to medium term? And is it worth the unease it causes in Moscow? Uh, who would like to take a stab at that first? Uh, our Irish colleague, go ahead. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, obviously being from Ireland, I always take an interest in what uh, my other next door neighbor is doing. Um, on on Britain, we, mo we must remember, of course, that how these things become embedded in the specific Baltic context. And Denmark was definitely, and during the 1990s, Denmark was definitely a front runner, as Peter has excellently said. Um, but Britain actually, as a great power, 
did a lot of the groundwork before the later Clinton administration, then the Bush administration kind of finished the job with enlargement. And, and we had a lot of preparatory work done by, by British security planners. If we put a name on it, uh, General Sir Gary Johnson, I think Andres will probably know more about this era than mine. He's of that vintage. Um, and of course, right up until this day, Paul Mill, the political military division for all three Baltic states is, is based in Tallinn. So when we go down from the political level to the military operational level, that link between the United Kingdom and the Baltic states is, is still very strong, as in just the final point, last week's integrated uh, integrated uh, security review in, in the United Kingdom. Yeah, again, it's Britain giving mixed messages, but Britain has been giving mixed messages for many years now. Um, if they it definitely, it was a 10,000 uh, 10, decrease in land forces, but that might not necessarily a bad, be a bad thing the way EFP is structured based on mobilization. Uh, if these forces are, are made um, are more flexible, are more mobile, uh, even if it is a smaller force unit. And on uh, EFP's utility, yes, if there is a, a kinetic um, tank to tank kind of conflict, um, the place may be overrun, um, but the stakes are very, very high. That's the point of, of, of tripwire deterrence. I think Peter and Sten Ruining and Jens Ringsmos have been writing about this that if it's not just the conflict between Russia and the Baltic states that EFP and the multinational nature of, of EFP uh, means that Russia will be triggering a much bigger international conflict. And does Russia want that? Russia probably doesn't. So EFP uh, continues to do its job. And, and Britain has been a fervent supporter of it. Marilis or whoever. I think Peter wanted to say something first. Peter? Yeah, I, I, I'm actually a very, a very big fan of, of, of EFP and the way it's structured, because it's true that if the Russians decided to mobilize 40,000 personnel and attack the Baltic countries, they could probably overrun them in a matter of days, as the RAND uh, report that was discussing this also has pointed out. But I, I, I must imagine I, I have very, very great difficulty see, see seeing that ever occurring as long as the EFP is present. And I actually think that the, the whole idea about the EFP to put 4,000 4, personnel into the Baltics and Poland to signal to Russia that if you attack these countries, then you're going to kill some French, you're going to kill some Germans, you're going to kill some Brits, and most of all of all, you're going to kill some Americans. And they're probably going to be so annoyed with you for doing that, that they're going to have a second round of this war and take back the Baltic countries because that that will be un unacceptable for all of them. So I think that the deterrent logic uh, behind the EFP is sound and I've always supported it. I thought it would be really stupid to put in uh, 40,000 personnel into the Baltics as Rand suggested because that would actually trigger the, the security dilemma. That would be make the Russians really worried that NATO might actually attack Russia. Whereas now they know that 4,000 personnel cannot attack Russia. And for that reason, we are actually not uh, triggering any, any uh, defend, uh, security dilemma in the Baltics. And as for the British commitment, I have a completely di different reading of it. I don't think that the Brits are sending any mixed si signals with the v uh, NATO or the Baltics because it's part of the, the, the Joint Expeditionary Force. They have made a very strong commitment to that. They conducted a major exercise uh, in, the, in the Baltic region uh, involving also Denmark last year. The big Biggest, uh, since the end of the Cold War, and I think that they are more capable of maintaining the rather modest deployment that they have with the EFP. And they know full well that unless they really make a strong commitment to NATO and retain their reliance with the US, then they're done as a great power. And if you read anything into the integrated defense review, then it's a desperate British yearning to retain this great power status. I have some doubts as to whether they'll be able to fi finance it, but the ambition and the signal, I think, is unmistakable clear. And for that reason, I wouldn't worry about the British commitment to the Baltics. Marilis, can you wait just a second? Because the final question that we have from the audience I, I, is directed more or less to you uh, as well. And it's uh, it's from Thomas Aikenbaum, who's in Canada. Uh, others can take a stab at it as well. but. Uh, the question is that 
There's been some speculation that the, the Putin regime might be tempted to strike out uh, because of its internal difficulties, economic sanctions against it, the tension about the Navalny imprisonment, etc. Uh, and the question is, is there heightened concern in the Baltic states presently that about imminent Russian action? Is there a need for heightened deterrence? Uh, so I'll let you, Marilise, being in Tallinn, uh, answer that one. Thank you. Uh, yes, we are monitoring the situation very closely, and uh, there are some some no, no, notes from the eastern Ukraine that uh, that there are troops gathering for the so-called trainings and so on. But uh, and as the leadership, as the relationship between the U.S. and Russian leadership is not is not that. Um, there, we cannot say that there is very fruitful dialogue at the moment, and um, and although although that we here in the Baltic states we do not uh, believe dialogue, we do believe in deterrence. So basically, I do not see if there is a very concrete to rise the level of troops here. But uh, what we would be interested in, to to ri rise the level of credibility of the deterrence is to have some U.S. troops more uh, here in 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 this rotating rotating units and uh, I would also add to the previous question that NATO is is an organization based on solidarity and that means it can be only as strong as it, as strong as its weak, weakest link and uh, and that the Baltic states have been entitled to be that to the Russian anti-access uh, uh, denial uh, capabilities so so yes the uh, and I would rephrase Alex's question that uh, he asked that if the enhanced foreign presence is necessary we we rather would ask that uh, and when, when that never there is never enough our security is never complete so I would not I would not uh, take that as a question but as a comment <laughs> Okay thank you thank you Marilise we've we've come to the end of our official time but I would give an opportunity for the panelists who haven't said anything in the question and answer period, meaning Karsten and Michaela, if there's anything that they want to uh, interject or respond before we wrap up. Uh, Karsten, you first. Sure. Um, there's a question there about Sweden. I can, I can have a stab at that. It's the last question there. Um, um, but first of all, EFP, I, I will make a prediction. Um, the EFP will stay there uh, until Russia becomes a democracy. So there we go. Um, when it comes to this question about Sweden and joining NATO, and it's an ongoing, of course, uh, debate, uh, and, and I don't think it's going to happen uh, anytime soon, but they are as close as it can be. And frankly speaking, from a military point of view, I'm not sure it really matters, because if conflict erupts in, in, in this or the neck of the woods, as they say, uh, Sweden will be involved. I mean, NATO cannot reinforce the Baltic states without using Swedish territory, and there's no way Sweden can politically, uh, and Finland can, can, you know, be standing passive. So in, in a way, from Nordic security perspective, it's it's much more important with Sweden than there's some NATO allies on the southern flank. Um, so, so any other, yes, it is um, a you know, challenge that they're not part of NATO because they've been come to the detailed defense planning because they can't be part of that. But in all other aspects, they are as close as they can be, uh, and and you know are operating more and more closely. And we all have social, you know, through the, also the, the strengthening of the Nordic Defense Cooperation of the last few years has been much more focused on the regional security. So so take it together. I think I think, uh, and, and also to add to Peter's you know discussion, we we the, there's a new the, there after 2014, the Nordic states uh, and the Baltics have much more shared security outlook division. It's it is a regional question. It's not like one looking east, one looking west. You know, it's because of the because of the nature of the, of the threat. We are we have much more shared security concern among all these countries. And I think that's that that's a good platform for, for enhanced cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Karsten. That was very reassuring to hear for a for a Baltic person. So I'll give the final word to to Michaela because he's the reason we're all here. His uh, the book that he edited. Uh, so, Michaela, perhaps a few final words, and then I'll wrap up. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks to the, to the whole of you. I think it's been a very brilliant, and very stimulating panel. Um, allow me to to share myself in two. First, as the book editor, and second, as a co-author of the Spanish chapter. 
as a co-author of the book, I, said, I, I think that the, the, I repeat it again, the, the, it has been a very brilliant chap uh, discussion, very stimulating and interesting. I couldn't agree more with basically all the things that's been said, especially with Karsten's last comment about the EFP is there to stay. Uh, uh, second, I would, as a sort of fruitful thought for, for the panelists, but in particular for the, for the public, we haven't talked in it, uh, so far about the Arctic, the Arch North, and I think the Arctic, especially given climate change, uh, perhaps the uh, Karsten presentation was going in this, in this direction even more, it will necessarily acquire a, a even greater role in the years to come. Uh, there are many interests in the Arctic that will likely be securitized. Last but not least, allow me to intervene as a sort of from, from South of Europe, from the southern flank. And uh, I think there's a rising question from the our the club met here, uh, which of course we we need to reconcile uh, the security, the, the legitimate security concerns of all the allies. Um, there's a growing consent, there's a growing sense, let's say, here in the South. I guess the, the ongoing incident in the Suez Canal could be a sort of indicator about this. What is going to happen in the years to come to the Mediterranean Sea? We are absolutely, you know, we are, the, the, the in particular is a contributing to EFB. Uh, we are absolutely agree with the fact that the legitimate concerns of, of Allah is concerned. What is going to be the future of the South? So how will the rising securitization of the naval route of Chinese neutral growth will affect NATO? And I think that the, the debate the, will likely to be readdressed, continues to be redressed in the future, also because of that. So the future looks very interesting. <laughs> to be mild uh, and thank, thank you. All right, uh, to conclude then I would like to thank all the panelists for very substantive, informative, interesting, disciplined uh, presentations. Um, and to thank the audience for, for tuning in and asking uh, good questions. Um, and it remains then to urge all of you to go out and buy this book, but perhaps more realistically urge your library to uh, order the book. Um, so, uh, and finally then, uh, thanks to the organizers, the uh, Johann Schutt Institute of Political Studies in uh, Tartu, and meaning primarily then uh, Miley Wilson and uh, Owen McNamara.